Hoka, Tacton, X2, the long-awaited update. It's here. We're ready to talk about it. Finn, how are you? I'm doing great. It's great to be back. I've really uh, been excited by the last few shoes we've reviewed, including this one. Yeah, we've actually, yeah, we've, we've, we're on a bit of a hot streak in terms of reviewing some really fun shoes. And I think this one's going to keep that momentum rolling. So yeah, where do we even start with this Tecton X2? It's funny, like this shoe got a lot of hype and, you know, I feel like it, it was like a very like long awaited update, which like spoiler alert, it's just an upper update, but I, I was going to ask you, Brett, is this the least changed shoe that we've reviewed to date? Maybe actually a lot of the shoes that we've tested so far have been like full redesigns or new models. Whereas this one's just an upper, upper update from the previous one. Um, an upper update that I think was very necessary though. I like, you know, I like the formula of, of what they've got going on. Yeah. Before we, before we dive into it, just want to let everyone know that these shoes were provided to us by Hoka and running warehouse and we're under no financial obligation to say whether we like a product or not, because we want to keep these reviews authentic and beneficial for you. So no one will get to preview or watch this footage before it gets published to YouTube. Hoka Tecton X2, $225. So it did get a price bump. Uh, the first Hoka Tecton X was 200. This one's now 225. So the big debate, I guess that we're going to throw out there at the very beginning of the episode is, is this new upper worth $25 more? The weight of the shoe, mine came in at 9.3 ounces. Uh, I have a men's US size 10. That's a 9.3 after 100 miles of running. So uh, still pretty light, even with a bunch of dirt on it, which I think, that's, I think that's an important thing. I'm still trying to change the narrative of weighing shoes after we're running in them because a new pair that hasn't picked up a whole bunch of dirt, that weight doesn't matter. This weight matters. 9.3 ounces, that's pretty good. Uh, stack height, we're looking 29 millimeters in the forefoot, 33 millimeters in the heel. Um, that's the same as the first generation Tecton X. That's, uh, also including the lug depth, which I believe we're looking at three millimeter lugs, three. five millimeter drop. So yeah, the biggest change of the shoe is the upper. Um, it got a new upper matrix is back. Some of my favorite uppers of all time were matrix shoes. We were talking Hoka Mafate Speed 2, or Evo Mafate Speed 2, Hoka Evo Speed Goat. Now the Tecton X2 gets the Matrix upper. Uh, what Matrix is, is it's it's a brand. I, I, th I don't know if Matrix owns themselves or someone owns them, but Hoka does not own them. So there's Matrix uppers on other shoes out there, like Normals, Chirac has a Matrix upper, Solomon, uh, the new S Lab Ultra Three just got the Matrix Upper. The Genesis has a Matrix Upper. So uh, this tech exists across different brands. What it basically is, though, is it's a it's a mesh with Kevlar fibers woven all the way throughout. And what that does is it allows the material to be extremely strong, really lightweight, super thin. And one of my favorite parts about it is it doesn't stretch at all ever, um, and it doesn't hold any moisture. So we'll talk about all those pros um, in a bit. It's also very durable. Those who've had the previous Tecton X, you know, were familiar with the the lacing that went all the way, almost down to the toe. It was more of an approach shoe style lacing pattern. That is gone. We're now back to your normal eyelet start point around the ball of the foot, and it just goes up. It's yeah, it's it got more normal. Pretty thin tongue. You know, there's like maybe one piece of foam right there around like where the high point of the arch would be. Gusseted tongue. Again, it's one of those things where it's like most shoes should just be like this. Uh, it should just have a thin tongue. It should be gusseted. It won't move around much. Um, one of the things that I do like about this upper is uh, going to the forefoot. There's a little piece of soft fabric uh, yes. right over the top of the forefoot. You don't need matrix material there. Just throw a softer material there so that way... If you have a narrower foot like I do, or even a wider foot, you get the bunching or you get a little bit of pressure across the top. It's comfortable. I appreciate Hoka doing that. They did that in a couple of their previous shoes, but then it disappeared for a while, but now it's back. That's pretty much it for the upper. Uh, 
everything else like pretty pretty standard heel cup it doesn't have the the clifton swoopy elf thing going on it's pretty pretty normal going on a uh, soft pretty soft materials on the inside um i'd say medium to thinner amount of foam around the ankle and the heel do you want to debate the upper really quickly you want to talk about it yeah like old, old versus new I mean, yeah, what? I think like a lot of people, because I was looking at watching a couple reviews out there and people are saying that the lockdown in this updated Tecton X2 is better. Did, did you get the sense between V1 and V2 that with this updated upper, there is better lockdown? Because I know you had mentioned you had some issues with the lacing pattern, especially towards the top of the shoe near the ankle. So what are your thoughts there? Yeah. So my problems with the lacing pattern were mostly that I use the top eyelet to get the most lockdown for this shoe, um, which is pretty common for me. A lot of times I lace up to the very top eyelet. When I did that though, the tongue was like two millimeters too short. Um, that was the biggest thing. So I got a little bit of lace by it up top. Um, never, I, it, it had definitely been much worse in other shoes. Like I was able to descend all the way down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon in this shoe, tightened up as much as I needed to. And I didn't have any yep. lace by problems. So it was fine. Um, I would have just loved, you know, the comfort would have been a little better if the tongue was two millimeters taller in terms of, uh, getting, so I didn't have any lockdown problems with the first Tecton X. I will say though, that I was able to achieve that same level of lockdown much easier in this new one. So the other one I had to like really tie the laces, like I had to start tightening them up all the way from the very bottom and like be very precise all the way up through the like 12 eyelets that the shoe had this one i can pretty much just slip it on give it a little tug tie it and it's good it's like perfect all the time and it just it doesn't change because this material hasn't changed at all um over uh, you know 150 miles in the original tecton i had to like redo it because the upper did start to stretch um, so I was always able to achieve pretty good lockdown, but it wasn't anywhere near as consistent as this shoe. Yeah. What did you think? Cause you ran in the first Tecton X as well. Yeah. I mean, we'll talk about it in a second. I loved on, on principle by look, by initial feel like out of the box feel. I loved the original Tecton X. I was telling you offline that I took not one, but two pairs of the original Tecton for initial runs in the white mountains in New Hampshire and in both pairs of shoes on subsequent runs, the outsole, the lug started to immediately delaminate. That was not an issue on this update, updated version, but I never got more than 10 miles on either pair of those V1s because of that. That's so strange. Yeah. I like, I so really crazy. want you, I really want you to like take this out to the whites and see, uh, see if that happens. Or maybe Hoka did just change up their glue for this one as that could be an inline change that they don't need to advertise. They don't need to tell us if they change their glue. The midsole, uh, I mean, there's not much to talk about, but I'll go, I'll give a brief rundown for those who aren't familiar with the original, uh, Tecton X. So it's, it's an EVA midsole. So there's no like super foam, like P backs or PBA in here. Um, there's two different densities of EVA though. The top layer that's sitting right underneath your foot is a little bit softer. The bottom is a little bit firmer. Hoka uses what's called their pro fly X technology in the midsole and basically what that is that's just a feel so it's softer in the heel firmer in the forefoot this one like yeah you can notice that the heel is a little bit softer than the forefoot and it's supposed to just give you that like springier more aggressive race type feel um sandwiched in between the two layers of eva is their carbon plate which has a big old split down the middle of it that's kind of where the whole tecton part of the name came from tectonic plates uh the plates shift and move independently um yeah it's an earth pun and hoka went there with the shoe like that's what it was there for um and their whole idea behind that was having a big split through the middle um the shoe would be able to twist like uh torsionally a little bit more to move on the trail as opposed to your traditional super shoe carbon plate that doesn't allow the shoe to twist and maneuver very much um whether that works well or not we can get on into a little bit later yeah. the outsole unchanged from the first tecton x it's two pieces of vibram mega grip rubber built upon their light base very shallow lugs i mean this is clearly not your mud or snow day type shoe um 
felt great on you know pretty wide variety of surfaces what did your uh total running mileage come to i put exactly 87 maybe 87.1 miles on this shoe almost exclusively in the salt lake city foothills so if you know the area the bonneville shoreline trail twin peaks ensign peak uh base of black mountain um on dirt jeep roads on dirt touch dirt dirt the entire way sweet right on i'm really loving this whole dirt trend you've got going and I will say one thing, I did two runs in this on roads, and I am of the mindset that if you just shaved these lugs off, this would be an excellent road shoe too. Oh, that was immediately what I thought about the first Tecton X as well. Um, especially last year, I was like, this is Hoka's best road shoe. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's their best road shoe anymore now that the Rocket X no. is out, but no. uh, I still think it's one of their best road shoes. Um, I got in... I got in 99.5 miles. I, re- I, I misjudged. I, I, try, I, I tried public math on my run yesterday and I was wrong. Uh, squeezing in a few last minute trail miles thinking I'd tick it over to 100 only to upload it to Strava and it's a 99.5. And I'm just not, I'm not going to lace them up and go run around the block for that half, half mile. I know I'm rounding that. I'm rounding that up to 100. I was just going to say, does conversational pace round up? I, d- I don't. I, 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 it's 99.5. I'm going to re- still review it as if it's 100, though. So I do round up. I also don't round up. I don't know. Um, what do you think of the fit of the shoe? Um, like volume, length, width, all that good stuff. Yeah, and you kind of warned me. I shouldn't say warned. You, you gave me the heads up about this ahead of time that it wasn't necessarily going to be an out of the box, great feel. Like let's take it for 20 miles. Let's do a long run and it feel like I definitely needed to put a couple, you know, 30 to 45 minute short, easy runs on it to really break it. And especially in the four foot area, but I would say right around 20 miles into the shoe, there was definitely a, a transformation in feeling. And I think a lot of the elements that this shoe is built around, like the efficiency that you get from that, I guess they're calling it nitrogen infused pro fly plus foam. Um, and then the carbon plate, like I definitely like felt like a bounce from that and like the efficiency from that to the extent that you can feel efficiency from a shoe on trail. Like I I definitely got that. Um, and I would say that like one of the concerns I had going in was that just like the, the, uh, toe box in this version two got a little bit narrower as well. I definitely felt that from the original tecton, but that felt like it almost widened out somehow with just subsequent miles on the shoe so by the end it felt like a great ride but it it wasn't like the speedland or um like the wild horse or, or the kyger that we're currently testing now that i felt like um i could run just like a, a run in the canyon like immediately like i needed i needed to break the shoe in a bit so yeah that was my experience yeah i totally agree i mean we did an unboxing video and like i remember like right after we stopped recording it i like threw the shoe on my foot and i was like does it run small? Like I, I genuinely thought it was running about a half size smaller than the original one, just because of how snug the toe box felt. And it felt like my toe was pushed up against the front. But then after doing like two runs in it, it now almost feels like, I almost feel like it's higher volume than the original one. And that might just be due to the lack yep. of laces down there, but like it really opened yep. up a lot. I think part of that might just be to the matrix upper is a little stiff and it's a little starchy to start. Um, so now that it, you know, it's had some runs and it can bend, it moves. I think it moves around my foot a little better. I do also think that there's an amount of compression that happened in this, the, the stock uh, insole in this shoe. Um, you squish down the foam on the insole, probably even the midsole foam as well that's going to free up a little bit more space. Um, So yeah, now that I'm kind of like squarely in the sweet spot of the shoe after a hundred miles, I I have no, I had no issues with room in the forefoot or anything like that, that I was actually a little worried about. And I know if that's something I'm worried about, it's like a hard pass for most people. Yeah. And actually you might need to put this back into our discussion around the upper, but there was one note I made here. Uh, with this new matrix upper, did you do any water crossings? I know that it's billed as uh, both drying out the foot pretty quickly if you do a water crossing or it repels water fairly well too. So did you have any experience there? Yeah, I did one creek crossing in this shoe. Um, That is my favorite part 
of the Matrix upper. I wouldn't say it repels water. It just doesn't hold any water. Um, okay. So like you can submerge this shoe, fully dunk it. And this has been the same deal with the Evo Mafate Speed 2 and the Evo Speed Yote, both Matrix uppers. When you, it just drains so well. It doesn't soak up any moisture. So like, and that's a rarity in a Hoka shoe. Most Hoka shoes feel like freaking sponges for so long after you come out of a creek. But this Matrix upper, it just drains. It doesn't hold that moisture. It's so nice. It doesn't gain a bunch of weight um, right when you get out of the water. So that's one of my favorite parts about about the Matrix upper. And then, and then also it dries really quickly. So uh, yeah, definitely... Definitely a lot of good things going on, which is why like this is one of my favorite uppers for the summertime because it doesn't hold that moisture. And, you know, I, it's like summertime or the spring when you're running through creeks, but it's also hot out. Your foot just gets really swampy. This shoe helps alleviate a lot of that. So, you know, we'll talk about uh, some ideal races for this shoe in a bit, but um, there's definitely some race scenarios where like, I would lean into an upper like this just because of how well I know it's going to drain out water and like not leave my foot sitting in a puddle for extended periods of time. Yep. Underfoot, how did, you know, I guess now that you finally did get to put an extensive amount of miles in a Tecton X, how did you feel about like the, the various midsole foams and the carbon plate all meshed together? Like, does it cohesively work? Yeah. I mean, I was trying to rack my brain around this. I I definitely, uh, both felt and then into the data just saw efficient, more efficiency in my running over time when using this, uh, Tecton X2. Um, and then just the bounce as well. Like, I I think we're going to talk about it in a second about what this shoe was made for, but, um, it was very like especially like mid run once you get like 20 or 30 minutes in, into a run with this shoe and like you've kind of like shaken out the cobwebs and like your muscles are firing etc it's hard not to go fast in a shoe or to want to go fast like this is very clearly a shoe that is built for racing um with the foam that's in there the carbon plate the structure of the shoe the weight like yeah i i felt i felt like a racer anytime i was wearing this shoe yeah it definitely didn't feel like a junk miles sort of shoe. Um, it was hard to almost relax into it, which is a good thing and a bad thing, you know, depending on what you're doing. But uh, yeah, it, it it just wasn't the shoe that I'm like casually taking for, you know, like my easy six miler, you know, easy recovery on the ditch, as as they say in easy the Ashland the Strava world. This isn't really the shoe I'm going to take that on. Um it it does have that springy feel to it. It was interesting the like the shoe that I ran in the most prior to this was the Speedland GS Tam, and I think the GS Tam is far bouncier than this in terms of the underfoot feel. The biggest problem with the GS Tam's underfoot bounce was that the shoe was like three full ounces heavier than this. Yeah. So even though it was way bouncier, it was just heavy. So even though I feel like this shoe's not nearly as responsive at the speed land, the fact that I'm just moving so much less weight underfoot, um, I felt that feeling of like light and quickness more just because it is for like the, the stack to weight ratio is like pretty off the charts on this shoe, um, which definitely makes it pretty unique, you know, and I, you know, I always say like weight of the shoe isn't everything, but when you do finally get one, that's like protective cushioned enough and still feels very minimal on your foot like that's what i want to be racing in one more one more thought i just had and i think part of like my thoughts on this shoe are clouded by the fact that we have the privilege of being reviewers and we work with so many different brands and we've experienced like every single type of shoe out there i i think back on like my 2021 self who was like almost exclusively a hoka where i'd wear the challenger i would wear the speed goat, I would wear like the Clayton and the mock, et cetera. Mm -hmm. If I was only a Hoka person and I wasn't from the shoe review world and this shoe came across my doorstep, like Amazon dropped it off, I would be blown away by the capabilities of this shoe. Like if I was in that Hoka lane and like I had the chance to wear this thing for a training block or race, like 
this this is a phenomenal shoe if i'm in that like hoka lane only and i haven't like seen the rest of the world of shoes so now that you've seen the rest of the world of shoes are there any shoes that immediately came to mind where you saw like overlapping with this that that we've already tested are there shoes where you're like well the hoka the tecton x was great but i think i might put this on instead yeah i mean i think that one of the biggest realizations I've had in the like six to nine months that we've been doing these reviews is that almost, we've gotten to a point where almost every single brand with a few exceptions is making pretty damn good shoes across the board. And like, I think maybe we'll talk in a second about whether like there is such a thing as a trail super shoe. And if like carbon plate actually makes sense on these types of surfaces. Um, I mean, we're going to review the Nike Terra Kiger probably, I don't know, in like a week or a month or something like that. Like, I loved that shoe for a lot of the same reasons that I liked this shoe. And that's not a super shoe by, by definition, but I, I see them actually having pretty similar use cases. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you mentioned the balance of the Speedland. Like I would also use the speed, that Speedland shoe in a lot of the same cases I would look to this shoe for. So I, I think you just realize that there are, there's a similar, there's typically a similar option at multiple brands out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think ultimately what you choose is going to come down to like fit for one, you know, you can just yep. be a little bit more specific and you know, what, what brand do you want to rep? What do you want? What do you want to be rocking on the start line? I think, you know, you're just more choices. Um, yeah. So, I mean, what did, Oh, I guess. Oh yeah. One, one well, last, what, what, do you, what do you compare it to? What do you, what do you look, what do you compare it to another, other brand lines? So, Okay. So the, 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 the number one shoe that I see this competing against is the Saucony Endorphin Edge. Like that is its exact, like that is its rival. Like this has more stability like, though, right? Would you say? I think so. I having run in both, I've got like 80 miles on a pair of Endorphin Edges. Um, I would say this Tecton X is more stable. It's a little bit wider underfoot and it's a little bit torsionally, uh, not as rigid, you know, the Tecton X can twist better. The endorphin edge is stiffer torsionally, um, which means on dirt roads, the, I like the endorphin edge better, but across the majority of trail, technical trail included, I like the Tecton X better than endorphin edge. I think the, um, the next up and comer to this category of shoe is going to be the Nike ultra fly. When that comes out, you know, super foam carbon plate lightweight you know we're not putting that emphasis on durability we're putting the emphasis on you know race ready shoe that you're throwing on for the important days um those are kind of the big three right now i feel like in this category there's the the speedland gs tam like wants to be in this category but i feel like it's, i love that you mentioned them it's a little i think it's just a little bulkier like you like we said like you could do a 200 miler in the GS Tam, I feel like I would be hard pressed to throw this on for 200 continuous miles. Um, same with the Endorphin Edge and the Nike Ultra Fly. Better outsole too than the Speedland, no question. Yeah, that's actually interesting. That's a great follow up. So you you, you put you know 85 miles on this Tecton X two. How's the wear pattern? How's the wear looking on your outsole? I was telling you right before this recording that, uh, you know, on the speed land after about a hundred miles, I lost about half the lug depth in the back half of the outsole. I'm looking at this right now. I've maybe lost. And again, I have a unique strike pattern and like, it's inevitable that the back part's going to go before the front, but I've maybe lost a quarter of a millimeter at most mm -hmm. on the back half of this outsole lug pattern. So just more durability. Yeah. So from a pure outsole standpoint, you, you like, you have like a few, like at least a few hundred more miles of running in that Definitely. shoe in terms of like overall durability. How do you feel about this shoe? Um, has, have you noticed the foam qualities change at all over the, you know, 85 miles that you've run in it? Not really. And like, again, I, I say this as a bona fide lover of Speedland, like I was a total homer for them in our last episode, but like they build their shoe as a six to 700 mile shoe. I actually think this is the real six to 700 miles shoe. Like I'll take this at 700 miles over a Speedland at 700 miles almost all day, I think. See, I think I would take the Speedland midsole for six, 700 miles, but then I think I might take like 
this upper and outsole for six, 700 miles. I don't know if I see this just traditional foam lasting six or 700 yeah, miles. Like I've got a hundred on it. Uh, uh, yeah. I've got a hundred on it. And like, I, I've, I've got a hundred on it with like multiple, like three hour runs. One of them being like 5,000 feet of descending into the Canyon and back. Like that's a great tester for this shoe. Like this is a great shoe for the Grand Canyon actually. Um, but I will say though, that I am like, I have a pretty, like pretty good size divot and like indent of my foot in this shoe. Part of it is just the insole, but definitely a part of it is that midsole foam starting to compress. So I worry that the foam is going to be the limiting factor in the shoe holding me back versus the upper or the outsole. I would love to see what this shoe feels like without the carbon plate. Yeah. Like again, I keep harping a little bit on these carbon plated shoes and how I'm just not fully sold on carbon plates in the trails. Like I just, again, don't know what a plastic plate couldn't do that this yeah. carbon plate can. Like, I also am curious to see what no plate would feel like in this shoe because at times it did feel a little too stiff. Like there was a couple times in the Canyon where like it got a little squirrely because I, you know, stand on an angled rock and the shoe didn't, you know, shoe wanted to go one way. My foot wanted to go another way. And had there been no plate, I would have had that extra flexibility. I'm curious to see how much sacrifice comes with taking out the carbon plate in the shoe in the form of like cruiser miles on really buffed out single track or dirt roads. Cause I know the carbon plate helps with that, but I, I would be so curious to see what this shoe feels like without a plate. I was going to say, what, what, why, if you could like go into the minds of Hoka's shoe production team, why, why did they make the decision not to have a replaceable carbon plate the same way that Speedland decided to do it? Well, the reasons why you wouldn't want it to be replaceable are that you don't get to anchor down all the parts of the shoe below the forefoot or like below your foot that well um on the plus like on one hand you have speedland saying this plate is loose in the shoe it's not locked down by glue it can move independently in between the layers of foam it's going to do its job better you have other companies saying the exact opposite in that if the if the plate can move independently without you know influence of the foam it's just moving around in the shoe it's not doing anything mm. So like, and again, my question is, what about when you apply that to trail, which one matters more, if any at all? And like some of my favorite plated trail shoes have been like, like the Solomon Pulsar Trail Pro 2. That's one of my favorite utilizations of a plate. It's not carbon. It's like a fiberglass material. That's a little bit less stiff. Um, I think, you know, if we're going into like the minds of the Hoka designers, like what, why did we put a carbon plate in the shoe? It's because we have to, because the carbon, carbon is the buzzword right now that everyone's buying. And if you say it has carbon, you can now charge more for it. If it's a plastic shoe, the shoe can't be 225. If it's a plastic shoe, the shoe's 170. So that's why I'm just like... I don't know. I'm just not sold that it's anything more than just an expensive rock plate still. So if I was to ask the question, is this a trail super shoe? Is that a non-starter because there's no such thing as a trail super shoe? I like, still don't how think do you answer that. I still don't think there's anything as a trail super shoe. Well, one, because all trails are different. Like we would have to say like, is this a trail super shoe for this race? And then any other races that fall under that category, like what might, give you an advantage economically at Western States, probably not going to give you that same advantage at UTMB or hard rock. Okay. So like, that's where like, what's Hoka going to do? Make 19 different trails, super shoes. Like they got to put all their eggs into one basket and I don't know what it is. I mean, I think for this shoe, it's Western States. I mean, um, you know, what did Hoka design the shoe for? I mean, they call it their fastest trail shoe running warehouse calls it like their trail racer. Like this shoe was clearly meant for racing. It's interesting. I was watching this, uh, YouTube video. It was one of Hoka's reps and they were talking about all of the athlete feedback that they got for this shoe. And they mentioned UTMB, I think five or six times in a two minute video. 
like they said that almost all of their product feedback from athletes was coming from the UTMB realm and making sure that this shoe had the final touches to be like efficient and powerful uh, circling the mountain, which I think is interesting. See, I find that so fascinating. And like, you know, the counter argument to me being like, this is not a UTMB shoe, I guess is like Jim Wamsley only wearing this over in the Alps. Like this is his UTMB shoe. Like he wore a blacked out version of this last year at UTMB before this was announced. Um, like it's, it's his UTMB shoe. And like, I've run on a lot of rocks in this shoe. And if I'm a Hoka athlete, I'm definitely wearing the Mafate at UTMB. Like that's the yeah. shoe that I would feel most safe in. And like, if I feel comfortable and safe and secure in it, that's going to, I'm going to run the fastest in that shoe. I didn't, I agree. I agree. I, for like technical stuff, I don't think like, this is fine, but like, I want it to be great if I'm racing. Um, like it can totally do it. It's fine. But I don't think it's a great technical shoe because it's still too stiff due to the carbon plate. But yeah, so Hoka, you know, Hoka called this their race shoe. I I actually I wore the first Tecton X for the first 50k of Western States last year. I chose it because it has really great rock protection. Because the first 50k of Western States, it's mountainous, but it's not overly technical. But there's definitely some rocks where you don't really want them smashing your foot. I mean, you've gone across the high country up there. Um, we actually, we yeah. both ran it on a year when there was virtually no snow. Um, no snow. And there's like, there's a good amount of rocks up there, but I wouldn't say it's technical. Yeah. Um, so I chose this shoe because it protected my foot. It did a great job. It was fantastic. And then I changed, I swapped out at Robinson Flat. Yeah, I mean, I see like, like Cole Watson just wore this at uh, the Canyons. 100k he was wearing the original tecton x i think at uh black canyon those are races where i see the shoe shining not so much like utmb yeah. what do you think agree i mean I, I said earlier in the conversation that i took the i took the first version of this shoe which has i mean it's an identical outsole right same lug pattern same lug depth all that kind of stuff took it on two runs on fairly technical northeast new england trails and the outsole, the lug started to delaminate on the first run. And that's like in my head in that moment, I'm like, this is totally like a California carpet, Western States style uh, trail racing shoe. Make no question it fits squarely in the racing category. Like this is not like an everyday trainer, in my opinion, or like a recovery mile shoe. It's very squarely a racing shoe. But I think it's like you said, like it's a, a racing shoe expressly built for like a Western States. Yeah. Canyons. And, and I guess it, another thing to go off that is I didn't really like hiking in this shoe that much. Um, like I definitely got to do a bit of hiking coming up out of the Canyon and I just, I don't love the way, uh, carbon plated shoes hike because there's already that added stiffness to bend the shoe. When I'm now on my toes, it, it, there's the counter forces pulling my heel down. Like that activates the calf and the Achilles even more. If I'm if I'm hiking a lot, which at like a race like UTMB, I'm going to be hiking a lot. Yeah. I need something a little bit, just a little bit more flexible, so I can hike uh, more comfortably. And running races, though, this is a fun one. So, yeah, I would do a, I would do a lot of trail running races, um, but I don't know if I would do yeah. like big mountain races in this. Um, what do you think about the price point? Two hundred twenty five dollars. Yeah, I mean it's steep for sure. The other, the old one was two hundred dollars, and you know this is two twenty five. I think this upper is a huge improvement over the first one. If you bought the first one for two hundred dollars, I think you should absolutely be. You'll be fine buying this one for two twenty five because I do believe that this upper is twenty five dollars better. Um, you're gonna get uh, a much more reliable fit every single time over the course of the entire uh, lifespan of the shoe, and I just thought, yeah, I just found the upper was more reliable. The one durability issue that some would call it a durability issue, I won't, is that the um, what what are what are the the, the the plastic, the overlay? That's the word. The overlay that was glued on top of the matrix upper upper on my left foot on the very first run that I did in this shoe, they all started to peel and uh, <laughs> delaminate. You know, like. We could yep. 
see where we're at here. Like, you know, like they're all coming off. Um, but it didn't affect the ride, the lockdown of the shoe at all. Like those orange overlays, 100% purely cosmetic because they're just hanging there. I could have cut them, um, but I just left them and just kept running in the shoe. And my right foot, they did not delam at all. Left foot, they all completely delam. Both shoes felt exactly the same. So I guess if that happens to your pair, um, try not to get too upset, even though I, I understand that like having little plastic pieces flapping off after you just paid 225 for a shoe is pretty crappy, but it won't affect the ride of the shoe. No, it's all cosmetic. So take that, take that however you want. Um, I, I, I have talked to people who've had this shoe. I, so far, I'm the only person that have that has had their upper start to delam like this across the overlay. Um, did yours have any? No, I was just going to say that I was I was the only person that I knew in our group of friends that had any outsole delamination issues on the first one. So it could just be that we ran into some bad luck. Yeah. So, but you know, from an actual performance standpoint, it was totally fine. Like no issues at all. Um, yeah. So where, where you're getting the value is you're getting a really lightweight, high stack trail racer with a lot of good protection that feels fun to run in. You know, you're not, you know, it's probably, you're not going to get like 60%, you know, it's almost a hundred dollars more than the, the Nike wild horse, probably going to get the same amount of miles out of it than the wild horse, like maybe even less. I mean, that wild horse is a tank. <laughs> That's not where the, the value of this shoe does not come from the sheer amount of miles you're going to get from it. Uh, Brett, in terms of comment section debate questions, are you going to set set it on fire by asking whether there is such a thing as a trail super shoe or what's going to be the, the debate question for this episode? Well, yeah, I mean, is there such thing as a trail super shoe? If so, what is it? Where did you take it? And where is your proof that it made you better? than something else um because so so far i'm i i have yet to find like that answer of like it's a super shoe i just don't think there's been anything in trail that's given everyone that massive of a performance increase like we've seen on the roads will we ever get there maybe maybe not like maybe that's maybe that will ultimately be the conclusion after all of these years of putting carbon plates in trail shoes is that trail is the equalizer. If you want to compete against people, not in super shoes, maybe that's what we're going to learn this whole time. And that trail is really where the purity of the sport ultimately lies. Yeah. If you thought this review was helpful, if it brought you some knowledge, if it sparked some debate, feel free to subscribe like this video. If you want to try the Hoka Tecton X2 and your local run specialty shop does not carry the shoe, feel free to use our code that's in the show notes uh, to get the shoe from our friends over at Running Warehouse. Your purchase helps support the channel and for us to have uh, more review slash shoe debates like this.